be boring, but his guests aren't. It's Al's Boring Podcast. Oh, hi there. Al Dukes here. And my guest on the podcast today is Paul Turner. Hi there, Paul. Hi, Al. It is a pleasure to be here. Paul, you are uh, the voice of WFAN and uh, many radio stations and TV stations around the country. You have what I imagine, like to me, I'd be like, "What?" that seems like a great job being the, the, the voice guy on these radio stations. It is a good job. I always joke with people it's uh, you know certainly better than working for a living uh, because, I mean, I talk. Well, I guess, I mean, you know, talk show hosts could probably say the same thing, but um you know, I, I get to work with a lot of different radio and television stations, um, just basically reading the copy that they write. Um, so it is. I mean, it is a dream job. It's it's something that I have literally dreamed about since I was a kid. And you can do it from your house, right? You, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Te- technology has made that, that impossible. I mean, year, a few years ago, there is no way that you could do that. Um, you would have to be... You know, either near New York City or Los Angeles or a major, very major metropolitan area, and they'd have to have a big satellite hookup somehow. Right. And uh, so when did you get started doing all this? Were you a a guy like when you were in grammar school where people like this guy's got like a crazy voice? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I did start very young, um, but believe it or not. Um, I started way before my voice actually changed. In fact, I have there somewhere there's tape of me on the air um, at a, one of my first radio stations in high school. I started my junior year in high school uh, where I, I really sounded very, uh, let's just say, effem- you know, effeminate. Right. Uh, you know, my voice was higher. Um, I was from the South. I grew up in North Carolina, so it definitely had a little bit of a twang to it. <laughs> and uh, the voice change came uh, much after I got into the business. And when that happens, is that shocking to you? Like all of a sudden you have this big, deep voice? Well, you know, it's it's almost like the pieces just sort of fell into place like they were supposed to. Um, I, you know, originally my plan, I, I really enjoyed sports, and I thought I you know, wanted to get into sports broadcasting of some sort. And you don't have to have a big, booming, you know, uh, announcery voice for that. Um, but as time went along, I just, you know, a lot of people get into the business and then they fine-tune themselves. They, they end up going into programming or music. They'll go work for a, a record company. Um, and I just decided as the voice changed that, um, you know, doing voiceovers was what I liked. And uh, it kind of it kind of fell into my lap, so to speak. And if the voice is very familiar to people, you, you do all of the voiceover stuff here at WFAN. So the stuff that we play, like... Uh, you are listening to Giants football and Boomer and Carton in the morning, Mike Frances in the afternoon. That's your voice. How many years have you been here or doing stuff at WFAN? You know, I, I would have to say that FAN is probably one of my old, older clients. Uh, Mark Chernoff and I go way back. Um, I would say early 90s I started with you guys. So um, I get, I, well into the 20s, tw- maybe 24 years, 23 years, something like that. Now, I first heard your voice. You used to do all of the stuff for Howard Stern. Did yeah. Howard find you, or did the company find you, and then Howard found you f- that way? I was working at the time in Detroit, Michigan, for a station, and um, sort of saw the writing on the wall. The station was uh, going into receivership. It was about to change format. So I sent. I saw an ad uh, in one of the trade magazines looking for a voice, and um, the voice they were looking for was someone at that time, um, Infinity owned, um, the station, uh, K-Rock that Howard worked for. And they also owned stations in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. And as we spoke about a minute ago, the technology at that time had not quite gotten to where you could be in one place and transmit your voice. You literally had to go to the places. So they wanted someone that was central, they could put in Philadelphia, who could also travel to New York and do K-Rock stuff or travel south to D.C. Um, and spend three or four days and do the stuff for WJFK. Um, and it just so happened that I got the job, and um, Howard and I hit it off, and he was incredible to me in my career, absolutely amazing. So you got to go in uh, and do the show a couple of times, right? A bunch of times, yeah. He was, uh, you know, he, he it was just amazing the feedback that I would get. You know, I would get calls from production companies, um, I got lots of jobs that way. And, you know, um, just as things progress and time goes on, I ended up kind of moving more into the more serious news, uh, television news type stuff, sports radio, and uh, leaving some of that that kind of radio behind. But I do, I do miss it. And uh, he was amazing with me. He hooked me up with my first agent. 
and uh, was just a, a good guy to work for. So if, if somebody thinks they have a voice where they could do this sort of thing, how competitive of a field is it? It's gotten to be really competitive. Um, and I tell people all the time, I mean, you don't have to have a big, powerful, you know, in a world, that kind of voice. <laughs> uh, you can, have, I mean, there are guys, I, I know people that do cartoon voices. I know people that all they do is on hold messages for companies. There are companies that just do that. You know, the phone trees when you call a, uh, a big company. Um, so, you know, the, the, the business itself is really open to all, female, male, high pitch voice, low pitch voice. It's a really vast, uh, diverse uh, field. And it's gotten to the point, I would say, over the last 10 years, uh, the competition is amazing. And for the reason that you can do it from your basement. Um, every guy on the corner can have a studio in his basement. It's gotten so affordable. Uh, technology has gotten to the point where it's made that uh, you know, easy to do. And um, you know, it used to not be that way. So it's good and bad, I guess. And when you travel around the country, do you hear your voice everywhere? Uh, yeah, um, you know, I'm in a lot of cities. Uh, usually the way I work it with, uh, you know, stations is that if I'm on a TV, I can be on a TV station and a radio station in a, in a given market, uh, but only one, you know, that's, they have exclusivity. Uh, so, you know, I'm in a lot of markets. There's some markets that I'm not in that I've been in before or that I will be in in the future. It's a, it's a fun business, but it's also a business with uh, you know, a lot of revolving doors. I mean, you know, got, you know, management comes in, and they've got their own guy, so they bring him in. And, um, you know, that's gotten me jobs and lost me jobs before. But I do hear it a lot, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's gotten to the point where I'm sort of numb to it by now. And when you're hired by a radio station, let's say like WFAN uh, hired you all those years ago, d- can they send you whatever they want as much as they want, or, or do you got, do voice over guys make deals and say, hey, you could send me, you know, three pieces a week or two pieces a day, or, or, or is it sort of whatever the radio station wants? Great question. I, you know, that's where the agent comes in. And yeah. I'm very thankful to have good agents who, when they negotiate a deal, they, number one, first and foremost, is they look out for the client. They don't, they don't want to overwork you. And, I mean, that sounds crazy to some guy out there busting his, his <laughs> right. you know, doing a, saying overwork a voiceover guy. Well, yeah, you can, and you can actually get to the point where you lose your, your voice at the end of the day um, or just get hoarse and it just doesn't sound right. So they, got, they have to protect um, the overuse of their voice, and what they try to do is they come up with a dollar figure and a, an amount of copy that this station thinks they will need, um, and it's usually based on a, on a per-month need. Um, they're allowed X number of pages of copy per month, and if, uh, you know, for stations like, like The Fan, for instance, I mean, it's a very topical station. I mean, it's, uh, it's sports. You know, if you don't know the outcome of games until they happen, and you don't, you know, you don't know who's going to be playing who in playoffs until the day of or the night before. So it's very topical, and there's a lot of stuff to cut. Um, but uh, and then there's some stations, you know, that are just rock stations that you can do one page uh, every couple of months, and that's all they need. Um, there's just nothing, nothing topical about what they're saying. It's just, you know, you're listening to the best rock in the world, <laughs> that sort of thing. And do you ever get copy where you go, I'm not going to read that? <laughs> like it's just something yeah. that's uh, gone too far? Uh, well, <laughs> okay, I'll put it to you this way. Having been the voice of Howard Stern for 12 <laughs> years, uh, not much shocks me uh, any, anymore. I, I would say if there was anything that was going to really make me think that, it would have been when I was working with him because we, we cut some crazy stuff. In a good way, I mean that. But no, not really. I mean, I think most people are, well, first of all, everyone operates, you know, from a terrestrial standpoint under the, under the guidelines of the FCC. So they know they have a, they have a, uh, a border or they can't totally go over the line. And, uh, you know, but I have seen some crazy stuff. I mean, I can't think of anything specific, but a lot of, a lot of stations will have you curse and they'll beep it out. Yeah. You know, because that sounds cool on a rock station or they'll have you, you know, say something crazy about the competition, but uh, for the most part, especially in TV news, I mean, it, what can you do with that? That's pretty pretty uh, humdrum. When you were doing uh, the Howard Stern stuff, and, and he had affiliates in, in so many cities, especially, you know, his last number of years there, did that prevent you from doing other stations and other TV 
stations in that market? Like, were you? Did you at some point get pigeonholed as well? That's the Howard Stern uh, voice guy. That's funny. I think you're about the only one that's ever picked up on that. I've always had to explain that to people. Yes, yes, and no. I mean, it worked both ways. Believe it or not, um, there were a tremendous. You know, Howard's got a, a big following uh, among doctors and lawyers, white collar workers. It's not all just you know kids and you know and co- college kids listening to him. So there were some TV stations that were very big fans of Howard, and I actually got hired because of that. And then on the other hand, of course, um, they don't want some guy, you know, talking about some crude, um, you know, genital joke in the morning and then do, promoting their 6 o'clock news in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, it, it just really doesn't jive in the same market. So I, I, I understand both sides. Um, I think I would be, if I were a, a news director at a TV station, I might be a little hesitant to uh, bring in somebody, you know, that's tainted, if you will. Uh, and I, it's been a while since I've done the show, so I've kind of, you know, gotten farther away from that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it did. And, and also, it helped me pick up, you know, like the radio stations in the markets where he would broadcast to. They would also hire me a lot of times because they wanted continuity in their sound. Um, you know, to go from the, the the morning show network feed to their local feed. So you're when you're like working at places like uh, or doing when Howard was on uh, WYSP, WJFK, yeah. uh, the station KLSX in Los Angeles, then they would ask you to do the whole station just so that everything kind of sounded like the Howard Stern. Right, they, not all the time, but but I, that happened quite often. Where um, yeah, uh, you know, the success of his show obviously carried a lot of these stations. And they wanted uh, to give that the station that same kind of feel throughout the day. And um, and then yeah. back then, uh, and, and Howard, you know, changed over the years. But back then, Howard hated everything on the radio that wasn't Howard. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so did you ever have jobs for doing other radio shows that you couldn't do because you didn't want to piss off Howard, thinking, well, that he's my competition, you can't be the voice guy on there? Uh, well, you know, that's funny, funny you say that. That um, <laughs> One of the biggest examples of that actually came up with uh, with the fan uh, back when Imus used to be the morning guy. Um, you know, they are obviously, at the time, were arch rivals. You know, Howard couldn't stand Don, and I have a feeling it was mutual. Um, but as you know, I would because I was the voice of the fan, I would also end up doing a lot of Imus' stuff. Um Howard wasn't a listener of the fan, I take it, but someone called in one day and, and mentioned that, and it literally was like World War III. <laughs> I mean, um, he, he had me. I was, I was here in Philly at the time, and um, he had me on the phone within seconds. On and, the air? Oh, yeah, and was just, you know, literally le- just going off um, <laughs> the deep end with me. And, and I get it. I mean, that's, that's, his, that's his, it used to be his shtick. Um, not so much anymore. I think he's now a little more um, accepting of a lot of people. He, he's not as hateful as he used to be. Yeah, he went to he went to and still goes to therapy. He yes. talks about on the air. He doesn't hate people as much. I think he's learned to uh, <laughs> to sort of reach inside and find a, a warm spot for everyone. Yeah. But at that time, yeah, he he definitely nailed me on that one. And um, I don't remember the resolution. Um, obviously, I'm still the voice for the fan and. Um, and I was his voice for many more years after that, but uh, we found a, a middle ground, I guess. And what about, did you do some stuff for uh, Greaseman and G. Gordon Liddy, guys that had shows on um, in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. yeah, well, that was, I, as you remember, um, the Greaseman uh, and Don and Mike and, and those guys all came over to uh, work for Infinity um, at some point. And Howard hated it. He thought it was, you know, how dare them. But he never really, and I did, yes, I did their voice stuff. He never really mentioned that or that never came up. I assume it was because he just figured, look, you know, Paul's not, uh, you know, making anything extra from this. He's just doing this for the company because that's his job, and I'm not going to make a big deal about it. Yeah, your contract was with Infinity, uh, yes. CBS, and all of those shows were all under the same uh, right. owners. Right. That's how that that's how that fell, and I assume that's why it never came up with him. And did you do the Howard stuff up until he left uh K Rock and CBS. Yeah, right. Right up until, in fact, um, I would. Di- I went up with him. They invited me up. I had been gone probably for about six months to a year, uh, and they invited me up to do the last show live with them, be the announcer for their last terrestrial show, and they had the big uh, stage show and everything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was the that was the end. But it was a good good run while it lasted.
So I know uh, Howard used to like, and, and I imagine you find this in your everyday life, uh, you were uh, sort of a, a, you're, sometimes with radio guys with big voices, we see them, they're these large men, and you go, okay, that, that voice is coming from that large fella, I get it. You were not a, a large guy. No, um, and, and when I first started with him, I was probably 23, 22. Uh, I'm, I'm in my mid-40s now, let's say, um, but no, I'm... I'm Six three, I weigh about one ninety, and I definitely don't fit the image of a typical voice guy. That I mean, that the, the image you describe is exactly what people picture, and they always say, "God, I thought you would be, you know, four hundred pounds and." Uh, have a, they always say have a beard for right. some reason. Yes, always. I always think <laughs> of that too. Like the you always uh, picture the disc jockeys, like the radio guys, are just these big guys with beards and sunglasses on. Right, right. Like, uh, and well, I think a lot of that image came from you know the, the long hair and the sunglasses, seeing Johnny Fever and, and those guys at right. KRP in the seventies. But uh, but the big, I just think that the you know the impression of a deep voice kind of goes with a big guy and. Um, they don't think that a uh, you know a regular size guy would have that voice. Now, were you ever uh, like what what sort of things did you do to take care of your voice or get to that voice? Like some people, I know years ago it used to be like, oh, you should smoke, you should drink whiskey. That would help your voice become scratchier and deeper and uh, right. better for the radio. But is that reality or no? No, that's uh, in fact that's I've heard that a million times. You know that you want to have the voice that sounds like you gargle with razor blades. Yeah. Um, obviously those things do you more harm than good to take care of it. I've always made the joke that look in the winter, you know, and we're subject here in Philly as you are out there in New York to uh, spring allergies, fall allergies. And I, and I get them for a very short time, nothing serious, but I always say I can come to work, you know, uh, with a stomach flu, vomiting, 103 fever, no, no problem. I can put on a smile for a few seconds and do a read. But if I feel great, and I have no fever, but I sound horrible. If I have a scratchy throat or, you know, an allergy, then I'm sunk. I have to uh, take the day off or, you know, uh, at least let people know that, that I'm not 100%. So all you can do is really just try to, you know, keep healthy, keep well in the winter. And uh, I've been pretty fortunate in that area so far. Now, do you ever take, uh, like, a young voice guy uh, under your wing, like, show him the ropes, or do you see them? As, I would see that as competition. I'd be like, I don't need these, <laughs> I don't need these guys. I don't need yeah. to be helping out this guy. Yeah, well, uh, there have been some, some guys that I have, uh, have worked with um, that were maybe, like, producers at a radio station that I've befriended and have um, hooked them up with my agent, uh, as Howard did for me many years ago. Um, some hit, some didn't, um, and... Yeah, and they were usually guys. They were usually guys that had a completely different kind of voice than I did. So I, I didn't feel threatened or, um, you know, thinking that they would, you know, take my work away. And what about nowadays with all the technology? Can people uh, fiddle with their own voices to like my my whiny voice that I have? Could I make my voice sound like your voice? Well, sure. I mean, look, you you can. Um, I mean, if they can create a movie with blue people that look just like human beings, <laughs> and, and, you, and you convince you that they are real life human beings, they can certainly do that with, um, with voices, um, to a point. I really do, people have always said, look, you know, what if a computer one day can absolutely do a human voice? Um, will, it be, will, you, will you become obsolete? Uh, and there'll be no need for voiceovers. I think, it, I think the human element to it um, will always be there. And I, 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 that's just my opinion. And, and I could be way, way wrong. Um, you can use it. You can use, uh, there's a million different uh, cheap pieces of equipment that you can use that can deepen your voice, give you more of a, 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 a certain timbre. Um, but I still think there's that, you know, you can tell when it's a real voice and a, and a, and a fake voice. Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. It's Al's Boring Podcast with Al Dukes. Was there any ever anything that came your way where you thought, uh, you know, are they, are they sh- are you sure they want me to do this? Like that you felt like you, you weren't a fit for, but then it did end up working out? Oh, sure. And, and, and I do auditions quite often um, that come from my agent. And they usually send out auditions based on 
you know, the, the direction that the whatever production house or whoever is looking for this, uh, this job, they send a little description of what they're looking for. And sometimes I see them. I mean, if it says, look, you're looking for a you know, male, big, boomy voice, I, obviously that's a fit. But sometimes I'll see them come down and they'll ask for, I mean, something bizarre <laughs> that I know that they're trying to probably just get me to, to stretch and see, see what I can do in that area. And I've done it. I don't think I've ever nailed anything like that, but um, I'm kind of a, I mean, I hate to, to put myself in that category, but, and I'm fine with this, but I, I'm sort of a one-trick pony in that I have a niche. Um, you know, it's uh, definitely the powerful sports, uh, hard-hitting news. Um, but, you know, I can do a, a, a pull-back read as well, but um, certainly not a, you know, real high-pitched, friendly guy next door kind of read. What about a place where you thought, I should be doing the voice for that? This is oh, perfect for my voice. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there are times when I'll see a spot and I'll go, wow, that was incredible. Or, you know, you see a movie trailer or something that, uh, you know, you're just, you're just blown away by. And you think, well, I, 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 I know I could do that. Um, but, hey, they, they got a guy that, that they love in there, and he sounded amazing. So I understand that. I mean, it's, that's the way it works. Will you ever have the agent call and say, "Hey, get me, try to get me in on this uh, action"? Uh, yeah. There, I mean, there's been times when I've heard that, let's say, um, you know, that something's coming up, like a guy maybe leaving a station, or and I'll have my agent sort of step in, and because they they are very well connected. I mean, they know people everywhere. Um, so I've yeah, I've made that request before. Do uh, voice guys get along with other voice guys? Yeah, I, I, we do. I mean, there's a lot of them that I'm very friendly with. Um, and we, you know, supposedly, uh, my agent has a Christmas party every year, but it's always up in New York, and it's always on a weeknight. I, yeah, the war, that, that's radio. Anything radio-related, they have the, always the worst timing for I, Christmas I parties. I agree. And it's, especially for, I do mostly TV voice work, and nighttime is so important for the 6 and 11 o'clock news. So you, you can't think of doing anything, you know, between, let's say, 4.30 and 8 o'clock at night, and that would, that would require me traveling up to New York. So that's a big party where all the voice guys get together and, you know, powwow and talk. And I unfortunately have not been able to go in the last few years, but when I have been, um, I've always enjoyed getting together with the guys. And, and it, I mean, it is somewhat of a small community, getting larger by the day. But, uh, there, yeah, there's some good guys out there. That's got to throw off, like, a waiter or a waitress if it's a table full of voice guys. <laughs> yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess that would be a, a tough one. Now, uh, do you go to a production studio to do the, your work now, or do you do everything in your house? I do. I used to always. Uh, I always had this belief that I need to separate work from home yeah. and home from work. You know, I wanted to leave the house and go off to an office. So I always had my studios in office complexes. I always had them built. And it, I also used to do, it, as part of my voiceovers, I also had a full staff where they would produce other voices. And we had a production company. I sold that off a few years ago, but I continued to have my, my voice studio there in an office building. And then one day I, re I realized, look, I've got an unfinished part of my basement's unfinished. Why am I paying all of this rent? And technology now has gotten to the point where it can be so small. Um, it doesn't require a tremendous amount of overhead. So I, I had a, a studio built, and I'm telling you what, Al, it's been the best move I've ever made. Um, you know, I, I used to think, well, maybe I'm going to be one of those guys that gets sucked into watching soap operas in the afternoon. Or, yeah. But no, that's, that's not the case at all. I mean, I, it's, you don't have to travel. You don't have to worry about the weather. If it's snowing, you don't have to worry about getting in on a, a snowy day. You just come downstairs and do your, uh, do your stuff. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I did that about six years ago, and I have not, have not looked back once. Do you ever feel like, though, now you don't ever want to leave your house? Like when you have an opportunity to go somewhere, you'd be like, eh. Okay. Uh, no, well, I, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, no, not at all. I, I, in fact, this allows me to cut the grass in the summer if I need to, go see the kids play in some ball games. Um, it allows me so much more freedom um, because I, I, I do feel a little tethered to the house. I carry my cell phone with me. And I'm always checking my email. So if there's an emergency that pops up with a station, you know, I'm usually within driving distance where I can run back here real quick and do it for them. But there, there is a certain amount of, of a tether that, that goes on to the, uh, the house. Um, but no, I like getting out of here as much as I can. Believe me, I play, play a lot of golf and 
uh, try to try to enjoy life. When was the last time you had a job at an actual radio station where you went to work for the station every day? That was back when I was at, uh, based in Philly at uh, WISP and uh, worked for a guy there by the name of uh, Tim Sabian, who was just amazing, just very instrumental in my career. He he allowed me to do the work, you know, for all the Infinity stations and also start my own business at the time. I was really cultivating and growing this, you know, this burgeoning uh, voiceover business. And he allowed, as long as I did everything, you know, he would allow me to do the stuff right there in their studios. And, uh, you know, I'm so thankful and, and grateful for that. And uh, that would have been, I left there in 19, I want to say 97. And so that was the last time. Do you ever miss that? Uh, you know the atmosphere of the radio station. Oh yeah, oh you yeah, do, well, right. You, you know how that is. I mean, the, the the there's nothing more exciting than than working at a radio station in any capacity because you know you get rock stars that pop in. You've got there's always something fun and exciting. I mean, just the vibe, the energy, the uh, uh, the hubbub at a radio station is is great. But um, do I, you know, now that I'm just me here, me myself and I doing this. Uh, there's something that I like about that as well. But, uh, yeah, I, I think I'll always kind of miss that. Yeah. Um, and when you were there at YSP, were you creative services director? Yeah, that, that would have been the title, um, creative services director. I didn't do the commercials, like, um, you know, the, the car commercials. We had a production director that did those. So you did more of what they would call the imaging of the station. The imaging. And then when people, when I try to explain that to people, I say, look, if, if a, TV or a radio station is writing a commercial about itself, promoting we have the biggest Doppler radar in the <laughs> tri-state, or we, you know, we play the most music per hour. Those are imaging type promos. Um, there's a whole department inside of a radio and a TV station that that's all they do is uh, work, work on promoting the uh, the brand, which is their the product, the their TV or radio station. Are you ever out in the store or at a restaurant where people are looking at you because they surely don't know what you look like and they hear your voice and they know they know your voice, but they don't know where they know it from? Oh, absolutely. It happens. It happens a lot. I mean, you're right. They don't. And that's kind of cool. I enjoy that anonymity. Um, the but you see that, the looks on their face. Yeah. Yeah. We, they, they have no idea what you look like. And like you said earlier in the interview, you know, if anything, they're expecting you to be this gigantic, huge Grizzly Adams guy. So you're kind of an incognito at all times. And when these people, they say, they don't usually say, I recognize your voice from this. They say, man, you, you know, you sound like you should be in radio or you sound like you should be, have, be a broadcaster. And if I feel like it, sometimes I'll just kind of say, if I don't have a lot of time, I'll say, oh, thanks. That's very nice of you. Uh, but then sometimes I'll, I'll let them in on the secret <laughs> and tell them that's what I do, that you're right. You have a very good ear, very observant ear. And what do you do with people who say, uh, oh, uh, Paul, can you do my voicemail message? Like, oh. I'm sure back when everyone had the actual cassette answering machines. Oh, yeah. That had to be constant. How do you get out of doing that without well, looking like a jerk? Well, you know, I've done millions of those. And you really just, uh, you just sort of smile and do them. Because um, most of them are for friends. Um, yeah. You know, you do, I don't usually have strangers come up and ask for it. I mean, I have. I've had, like, friends of friends. But, uh I mean, how long does that take? Thirty seconds right. out of the day. So, did you have to, used to have a standard one that you used? <laughs> no, usually just... I would make them write. I said, "Look, write down word for word what you want me to say." And then, you know, sometimes it was corny and f- or funny, an attempt at comedy. But uh, sometimes it was just plain old. You know how you've reached the residence of Tim Smith or whatever. <laughs> And what do you say to somebody who wants to do this for a living? They think, well, I, yeah, I have a, maybe I don't necessarily have a, a deep voice, but I have a unique voice. I'd yeah. be great on a cartoon or I'd be great in a commercial. Or what, what are the steps people could take these days with technology being what it is and what's available out there? And, and do you need an agent? Well, uh, great series of questions. Um, you know, in my time, uh, which is not really that long ago, I mean, you know, go back 20, 30 years, uh, you really entered the business via radio. I mean, you came in as a, either a disc jockey or an intern working at a radio station, and then you branched out, met people, made some contacts, and got into the business that way. Nowadays, with the Internet and with uh, social media and with, uh, you know, podcasts, as you know, um, you can make yourself a superstar 
from your basement. Uh, in other words, you can get an audience from your basement. You, can, uh, you don't have to send out cassette tapes, as we did in the old days, to program directors and uh, pr- production houses. Um, but get, you know, and getting an agent, uh, it's sort of a cart before the horse. <clears throat> it's, yeah, it sounds weird because it's hard to get an agent unless you've got a little bit of credibility under your belt, unless you've got some work under your belt that you can show them that you've done. Um, it, it's not impossible. Um, you know, they really want, they, if you have a good sound and you, they can tell they can mold you, then they, you know, no problem. But it's much easier to get an agent if you have some, some, uh, some work. But then how do you get the work if you don't have an agent? So I, I hear that all the time, and it's really just... Um, when the timing is right, the agent will, the agent thing will seem right. In the in very beginning, I, I think you you really just become your own agent. Um, and I tell people, listen, if you do a spot for fifty dollars uh, for you know a local whatever, at least you've got some work now that you can say you've done. You got some, you got a, a, you got a tape of it, CD of it, or whatever, and um, that'll help you when you shop around for an agent. And other than yourself, who are some of the other top voice? Uh, over people in uh, that we would know of, and 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 what thing that may, makes them famous, where we would know them from. Well, uh, as you you probably know the probably the most famous, uh, unfortunately passed away two three years ago was Don Lafontaine. He was the um, probably the the guy that started the what we now know is the modern revo- modern day uh, movie trailer. You know, in a world, yeah, a few people have gone. <laughs> that guy, um, he he. He started that. Uh, there's a couple of guys. I know Howard Parker uh, pretty well. He's actually from uh, the Philly area. He's, he's a guy that you hear on all of those things. He does a lot of stuff for ABC television. Um, you, you know, I mean, there's, just, there's about four or five of the regular movie trailer guys um, out there, and they, they each have a different sound. Like there's a guy that I know who does a lot of Disney, and I can't remember his name. Um, so whenever there's a Disney movie, he has. It's not a kid voice, but it's a voice that obviously will appeal to kids and parents alike. Um, it's not going to scare them away, you know, uh, with Captain Hook coming at you. It, it's a very friendly delivery. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, there's so many great ones out there. I, I don't even know where to begin. It's just insane. I mean, and a lot of times I'll hear a guy on a job and I'll say, you know, I I bet you so and so could have done that so much better. Yeah. Um, but again, I'm not an agent and I'm not a casting director, so I'm just a guy sitting there listening from afar. And do you think from your work on uh, all the years with Howard Stern and the Infinity Talk Stations and now Sports Talk, are you a guy whose voice uh, the industry now considers as a guy who is for male-oriented uh, audiences? Yes, I, I do. I mean, that can be good and bad. And I, I, as I said earlier, I definitely think I've sort of um, created a, a niche for myself. Um, you know, I don't want to say typecast. I mean, that's like, you know, a term they use for people that play a character on TV and they'll never escape that character. Um, but yeah, I, I think so. I think from just doing it for so long, um, that's what people know you from. That's the kind of voice I have. Not to say I can't back off and be you know, a little more gentle, Paul Turner. But, um, and it's also, Al, it's what I enjoy doing. I mean, that's, to me, that's the most fun. I love sports. I love, uh, I love hard-hitting type reads. And, you know, television uh, oftentimes requires that. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely, may, I would say male 2554, that's me. <laughs> and do you ever do these uh, books on tape? Never have done one of those. You know, that's funny. I, those are... I would classify those in the, the type of, like, industrial read. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then those are reads, you know, a lot of times companies will hire people to come in and read these long, um, you know, 10, 12-page presentations um, about maybe employee safety or whatever. Um, books on tape are even a longer version of that. Um, I've never really done much in the long-form read. I don't know why, um, but it just, it's one of those things that I've never pursued and it's never come my way. That seems like a nightmare, just sitting there reading like a 300-page book out loud. I know. Well, you know, I've heard people talk about it that have done it, and apparently it's a lot less painful than we imagined. Um, They just sit there um, and read, and every time they mess up, they go back a couple words and keep going. And the person, obviously, they've got a lot of editing to do at the end, but it's the person reading that 
you know, you're right, it's, you're reading a book, basically. So however long the book is, that's how long you got to read. Yeah, Craig Carton, our morning host here, he had a book out, and he did the book on tape in his own voice. Oh, yeah? Oh, uh, He would come in every day with no voice. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, I, I, and I, he's got a very distinct voice. I, I, I know Craig's voice very well, and I can just, I, I, I bet you, and I think when you're doing your own book that you've written, you probably put a lot of emotion in it, and a lot of, you're, you're really trying to, to sell it. So, but I, I can picture that, yeah. Now, how many uh, hours in the day would you say you're doing uh, actual work? Uh, if I were to add it up, I would say, uh, and what's good about it is I can group sessions together. So I, I can do um, a group of sessions, let's say around noon, and maybe knock out nine or ten stations at one time, um, you know, post them up on my FTP site, and then I can go out and do some errands, do whatever, come back and do another group of sessions around two. But I say if, at the end of the day, if you add it all up, it's probably about maybe four hours, uh, three to four hours of actual recording. Um, I do use a program called Pro Tools, which is pretty well known by even by the general public, to record it on, and then I will cut out little flubs or whatever, just so that the producers don't have to do that. It's just a service that I do, and, uh, and then I send it up. So there's a little bit of editing that takes place right after I'm finished, just to kind of clean it up. Yeah, plus then they don't have the slip-ups in their hands that they could use <laughs> right, exactly. I, to goof I, around with. I've made many mistakes, believe me, in the past by leaving things in like yeah. that. And then they do a, yeah, they do a whole morning show about a, a mistake you made. Exactly. So it, it just makes it e- it's so easy to do. I mean, it takes seconds for me to take out a, a little, little uh, you know, recut. Um, and I just think it makes it easier on the producer's end because they're usually in a pretty big hurry, especially in TV, you know, when they get this stuff. But you're mentioning with uh, some of the TV stuff and the news, that stuff comes down. So you have to be available f- at night for the 11 o'clock news, yeah, uh, well, folks? Yeah, it, it's promos for the 11 o'clock. So obviously they're going to start running those after the 6 o'clock. So that would run from, say, you know, like 6.30 to right up until 11. Um, so those stories, yeah, those are breaking news stories. And, and I have stations, they have certain times that they're allowed, and they actually call in and direct those sessions. They're on the line with me uh, on the phone. Um, as I'm recording, they'll listen. If they like it, then they say, move on, let's do the next one. A lot of times they are very specific, and they have a certain kind of read they're looking for. Um, and, and I'm glad to have them on the line because I'd rather do it right than ha- you know, to have them be unhappy with it or have to call me back later. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, those, the TV stuff to me is exciting because it's so fast-moving. It's breaking news. You know, uh, when things, you know, like, for instance, the other day, as tragic as the San Bernardino thing was, I mean, that was fast-moving. It all came down, you know, right uh, mid-afternoon, and it was just boom, boom, boom. Um, You can picture a newsroom in the middle of something like that. So I I kind of get the the feel for that. I can feel their, their tension and their excitement. Now, I know you have a session coming up here. What do we got coming up in your next session that you're going to record? Oh, let's see. I've got a few radio stations. I've got a TV station in Miami that I do every day at 1145. Um, and actually, uh, about four or five TV stations I'm going to be doing it right after that one. So. Any WFAN stuff on your list for today, well, or, they're, know, or they're done? I know I'll see something pop up before the day is over. I, have a, <laughs> I feel confident. Nothing as of yet, which is surprising. Mark is an early bird. So yes, what? he is. <laughs> so I'm really shocked not to see something yet. Yeah, Mark's one of those guys where you'll get emails from, and you'll look at the time. It was sent at like 3.30 in the morning. Oh, I do. I'll look. It'll be the weekend. and I'll, <laughs> I mean, He's got to be the hardest working man in showbiz, because it'll be like Sunday morning, and I'll be getting up, and I'll see an email from Mark, you know, updating the college games from the day before. It's crazy. Yeah, he'll be he'll come in in the morning and critique the overnight guy from like something he did uh, at about two thirty in the morning. Like, well, how are you listening to this station all day long? Hey, man, it's a full time job. He it lives is. and breathes it. I love it. Well, I want to thank you very much. This is uh, Paul Turner, voice guy for WFAN and many radio and TV stations all around the country. And uh, many years with the Howard Stern Show during the, as we say, terrestrial radio years. Yes. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate you uh, coming on here. Al, it is an absolute pleasure, and uh, I definitely hope to talk to you down the road. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.